I'm going to move on because we could get, we'll get bogged down at this stage in the evening. If you don't mind, please save your comments or questions for later on because I'm sure they'll crop up again. I'm going to move on now to the specific issue of Gaza. So we're now honing down now. We've started with the Palestinian territories generally. We're going to hone in on Gaza that you'll be very familiar with. And this is the kind of image that you'll be very familiar with. Tragically, that we saw, that we saw last year for a, for a period of a few weeks, totally unnecessarily as it happens, if, if, if ceasefires that Israel had accepted had been accepted by, by Hamas as well. Um, I wonder if it reminds you of any other images from the Middle East that, we may, that, that, that this may remind you of. Well, it, it's almost interchangeable with the pictures we see from Syria that we've been seeing for, what, four and a half years now? And yet, the degree of outrage provoked by those images from Syria are, are, is minuscule compared to the outrage that was generated by this conflict. And within a matter of two weeks, two weeks of this conflict starting, the Lancet, here we are again, the pantomime villain, reappears on stage and publishes this open letter, so-called, to the people of Gaza. Some of you may have, may have heard of this, this episode. And the people who published it include some very distinguished colleagues of mine. I mean, I know Syrian charmers personally, um, and I know many of the other signatories personally. Highly intelligent, highly, extremely charming people. And I have to say to you, you don't need to read that fine text in detail. I've extracted some of the things. You can just glance through it as I'm speaking. There is barely a sentence in that extremely long letter. It's a 1,500-word letter. The maximum length of a letter that The Lancet permits ordinary people like you and me to publish is 250 words. This 1,500-word letter contains barely one line of truth. One line. All of this is complete nonsense. It's just not true. And the idea that Israel manufactured the crisis to masquerade a massacre, the there's no mention of rocket attacks, there's no mention of any responsibility on the shoulders of Hamas for this conflict. Um, and there's a lot of the discussion about the siege that they call the partial military blockade and the, and the hunger and thirst, and, the, and then there's this rather um, dark reference to targeted weaponry used indiscriminately and on children. And it get, actually it gets even worse. I haven't put everything in that I could have done. But not only that, I mentioned the issue of peer review in, in medical journals. But the other thing you have to do if you submit either an article or a detailed letter of that kind, you have to declare your interests. As, such as I did this evening, at the beginning of this evening, I declared my background and my connections with Israel. All of these authors are associated in one way or another with extremely anti-Israeli groups. None of them declared any competing interests. It said competing interests, none. And the other thing was that shortly after the letter was published, it emerged that the, the lead authors, Paula, uh, Paula Manduka and Sui Ang, had been circulating and endorsing blatantly anti-Semitic emails talking about the way this international, about talking about international Jewish control of the media and of the foreign policies of a number of key countries. And Mads Gilbert, that's the character on the second from the right there, a Norwegian pediatrician, actually defended the 9-11 attacks shortly after they happened. He's a man of extreme views. And there's a picture of um, Syrian Chalmers, my colleague, who set up something called the Cochrane Center. Now, the Cochrane Center has been highly successful. It bring, what it tries to do is it brings together evidence on what works and what doesn't in medical practice. So he got his knighthood on the basis of that, and he's a big name in, in the medical world. I mean, it was his work that led, led to the establishment of NICE and other similar organizations that really are there in order to assess the evidence about the efficacy of treatments. And yet, here is a man who puts his name to a letter that doesn't contain any truth in it whatsoever. 
There was a huge furore around this letter, and many of us wrote, and I wrote as well, I wrote a very detailed rebuttal, which they declined to publish. And one or two Israeli authors did actually get published, but it was all too little and too late. And some very well-meaning people in Israel at the Rambam Hospital in Haifa decided, look, this man obviously doesn't know Israel. Let's invite him, and he can see for himself that what's, what he's hearing about and what he's writing is simply at variance with the facts. So they invited him, and he, and he went to Rambam, and this is him giving his talk. And in it he said that he deeply regrets, I'll quote you his exact words, I deeply regret the totally unnecessary polarization that that letter has caused. Note his words. He doesn't regret publishing the letter, he regrets the response to the letter. Um, and when a number of us wrote to the publisher, we, we were getting nowhere with Horton, so we wrote to the publisher, Elsevier, and when that word of that got out, a, a group of people got together called Hands Off the Lancet, and because they thought, you know, the lobby were interfering with free speech. And um, as a result of that campaign, it got into the mainstream media, and one of the journalists, I think it was from uh, the Guardian or the Independent, asked the former editor of the BMJ, Dr. Richard Smith, for his reaction. Now, I'm, again, I've met Richard Smith I've, I've, on several occasions. Charming man, highly intelligent, well-informed. His verdict was, good on the Lancet, they are trying to speak truth to power. So again, there's this strange psychological phenomenon of not only accepting a certain degree of bias, but actually inverting the truth and believing that something that is blatantly false and indefensible based on the evidence is true. And, and the process continues. This is from a couple of months ago in The Independent, that headline. Um, and they were quoting a paper about infant mortality in Gaza in recent years, incidentally, not during the period that Israel was there. Um, and I looked at the original paper, and this is what the authors actually said in their discussion. These estimates are based on small numbers of deaths, and the confidence intervals are wide. The, the confidence intervals, it's a statistical term, which means that the true figure could lie anywhere between a higher level and a lower level. So the infant mortality rate could in fact be stable or continuing to decline. But that didn't matter. That didn't stop the media saying the infant mortality rates are shocking and Israel should be held accountable. Okay, what did happen in last year's conflict? Well, I'm sure most of you here will be very well aware of what actually happened. There were rockets being fired at Israeli civilian centers. And that Israel had to respond to those rocket attacks, as any, any country would. And the, the major casualties, there were about 2,000 casualties, which Israel says were 50-50 combatants to civilians. That the bulk of those casualties happened as a result of the ground offensive, which was launched, if you remember, after the discovery of the tunnels burrowing from Gaza into Israel. But even that wouldn't have happened had Hamas accepted an Egyptian brokered ceasefire, and eventually the terms of that ceasefire became the terms of the final ceasefire. All of those casualties, or most of them, could have been avoided. And then you've probably also heard, I don't think I need to tell this audience about the measures that Israel took to try to minimize civilian casualties. And I've highlighted in bold there the fact that no army in the world goes to such lengths. No other army in the world, including our own, and let's wait and see what happens because we know that we are likely to be involved in some military action in the very near future. Let's see to the extent to which these measures are so extensively implemented compared to what Israel did. And then, of course, there's this very peculiar moral calculus in the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's the only conflict in history where we get a running tally of the casualty figures as if that somehow tells you about who's got the moral high ground. It doesn't happen in any other conflict. But throughout Gaza, we got number of Palestinians killed, number of Israelis killed, and of course, there was a big discrepancy 
So one wonders what was the point of, uh, of providing us with such a detailed uh, account of the casualties. And they don't, of course, casualties don't tell the whole story. If they did, we would have erected a statue to Adolf Hitler in Whitehall, and we would have branded Winston Churchill a pro one of the world's worst ever war criminals because German casualties were so much higher than British casualties. But does that, is that, does that equate to a moral calculus as to who was in the right and who was in the wrong? No, they don't tell the whole story. And not only that, when you consider the matter of rockets that I remember um, John Snow of Channel 4 News dismissed as nothing more than firecrackers. Well, these are the firecrackers. And ever since 2001, 2002, when they first started being fired at Israel, if you remember, they were just, uh, they were mortars, and then they were katushas, and then they were grad missiles, and then they were fajir missiles. They're all coming from Iran, by the way. And just look at the range now. On that, that map on the right-hand side there shows you, shows you that these Gaza missiles can reach almost every part of Israel now. And even the furthermost perimeter of that arc that you see, the people there have only 1.5 minutes to seek shelter. And they do. And it's a, as a result of the extraordinary investment Israel has put at huge cost into early warning systems, into tunnels, into civil defense exercises, it's only as a result of that that Israeli casualties have been low. It's not for any lack of trying by Hamas. Um, again, a complex slide. I don't want to, to go into any detail. Just look, look at the bottom line if you can see it. 18,000 total attacks since 2001. They started in 2001. The first fatalities happened in 2004. Significant date. Significant date, because what we are told is that the rockets were a response to the Israeli blockade, the siege, as Hamas call it, after Israel left in 2005. Well, hold on, they've got their timeline a bit confused. Okay, Israel, the, fir the first rocket attacks came in the early 2000s, the first fatalities in 2004, and when Israel left completely in 2005 and continued to receive rocket attacks, that was when the blockade was started, the partial blockade. So the rockets couldn't have been a response to something that hadn't happened yet. And the other thing I want to draw your attention to, that the, the, if you look across the, the horizontal uh, text, is, a, is about the period that um, the various military operations took place, like cast-led protective edge. And after each of those, the total number of attacks, as you see the red, uh, the red arrows pointing down, the, to the total attacks dropped. And that shows you that actually these military uh, incursions were highly effective in stopping the rocket attacks. It, we hear that Israel's got this iron dome, so why should she worry about the rockets? Well, it's 90% effective. That's pretty good, 90%, but it's only 90% 90 effective. 10% gets through. I'll leave you to do the math, as they say in the United States. It doesn't mean there's 100% protection, and there never will be. And there's a quote from a resident of Sterot who makes the point that even if the rockets don't kill or injure people, people it's that constant fear of attack. People are living on their nerves all of the time. That's what's so damaging about the threat of these rockets, not just when they're fired, but the fact that the people who are within range, which is most Israelis, are aware that they could be subjected to another barrage at any time. And I'm going to move on pretty quickly. I, I recommend you to look at a website co called COGAT, um, which is the coordinator of the, the uh, humanitarian aid for Palestinian territories, because they have been letting through on a daily basis hundreds and hundreds of trucks filled with cement and other, with fuel, and with other provisions to ensure that the people of Gaza don't suffer. And the people of Gaza are not suffering in the way that we're, they're often portrayed. These are images from Gaza today. A new shopping mall, a new hotel. These are images we don't see in the mainstream media. 
I'm not minimizing the suffering of the people of Gaza, but we're not getting, we're not getting a, a, a balanced picture of what is going on. Okay, that's mini lecture two over. We're halfway through now. <laughs> And so you, you see the connection between the first part and the second part, and you'll see, again, there'll be a connection in what I go on to say about the occupation and settlements. Any burning questions or comments for in this five minutes? Yes. Just a sort of brief comment. I want to say thank you for bringing that tonight. But also, when people keep banging on the dinner, if you want me to put numbers, is the amount of visitors raised in Jewish people compared to the rest of the world, I think it's more like 20 or 23 to 1. Yes, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, one, one human life to me is exactly the same as another human life. And that's the view I've always taken. But I think it, it does help sometimes to give people a sense of perspective. So, for example, over the last seven to eight weeks, since the beginning of October, when the stabbing intifada started in Israel, about 24 Israelis have died. Israelis and others, actually. Not just, uh, not just Israelis. But um, 24 people think that's not very much. But it's in a country of 8 million. So if we, if we multiply that up to be equivalent to, say, let's compare it to what France suffered in that dreadful attack. You know, it's way in excess of what France suffered. But the world is obsessed, and quite rightly so, with what happened in Paris a couple of weeks ago. But what is happening in Israel now is being totally ignored. So for some reason, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, one human life is certainly not worth another. And, that, and this is something that Israel has been suffering, as you know, for many, many decades. Any other comments? Yes? Part of the reason I'm here is to improve my knowledge of the situation and to give some of the support. But my question is, I have a sleepy feeling in Israel. Who feeds Gaza? Because they must need hundreds of tons of meat a day, hundreds of potatoes or whatever. It's largely Israel. They, do, they are self-sufficient up to a point in a number. Of, they, have, they, have, they have some uh, homegrown agriculture, but it's very limited. And unfortunately, the priorities of the Hamas government are such that they tend not to take a great deal of interest in that. But yes, most of the subsistence comes from Israel, transferred by Kogat through the various crossing points on a daily basis. And as a result of that, fortunately, there hasn't been the kind of large-scale hunger and distress, that, although it doesn't stop people claiming that that has happened, the fact is it hasn't. And in fact, the United Nations recently complimented Israel on its efforts to promote the rehabilitation of Gaza, although at the same time managed to put in a few digs at Israel at the same time. But that's okay, they're entitled to do that. At least they recognize the basic reality that Israel is letting goods through in the crossing points. But as you saw from the map there, Gaza has another border, and that's with Egypt. Egypt has closed that border entirely. Nothing goes into Gaza from Egypt, period. And yet, I don't hear outrage about that for some reason. Okay, let's... If, yes, very quickly, yes. I, I have absolutely no idea, but I suspect you would have to be a fairly high up official in, in the Hamas organization to get access to those. I, I suspect, I don't know. Really? I mean, I do know many years ago, before the first Intifada, Israelis used to go to the beach. I don't know if they took holidays there, but certainly uh, Syrian Chalmers, who I mentioned earlier, he spent his honeymoon in Gaza. And, and Israelis used to visit and contribute to the, the Gazan economy, but of course now they can't. But the fact is, some people are, are doing all right in Gaza. Okay, let's move on now to the third topic, question of legality. Again, I won't bore you with a historical lecture. Many of you will know this story in any case. We're coming up in, in, a, in a couple of years' time to the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. 
and you will hear that the Balfour Declaration created Israel. And what right did Britain have to give the Jews Israel in the Balfour Declaration? Um, actually, the Balfour Declaration, although it was important, is not the legal basis for the establishment of Israel. It was a recognition of the developing Jewish national home, but it was the San Remo Resolution of 1920 where the League of Nations created the mandate system. And the League of Nations mandated, literally, Britain to develop the Jewish national home. That's why the mandate was created. That was its whole raison d'etre. It wasn't just, you know, somewhere down paragraph 23, clause 7. The reason the mandate was created was to promote the establishment of a Jewish national home. Anyway, we could spend the whole of the rest of the evening on this topic. Um, but if we fast forward towards the end of the mandate, 1947, Britain ends the mandate, pulls out, and there's a civil war and then an international war. There was a ceasefire in 1949, and those ceasefire lines are what people call the pre-1967 borders. So t very important to understand, there are no pre-1967 borders. They do not and never have existed. What we have are ceasefire lines that were temporary and they were agreed at the Rhodes Conference in 1949 that they would be temporary until there was a final peace agreement. The UN Security Council recognized this after the 67 war in its resolution 242 which did not call for a total Israeli withdrawal from all of these territories but called for a withdrawal to secure and recognize boundaries. There's that word boundaries being used in international law for the first time in relation to Israel. And then we have what people call the occupation of Palestinian territory until the establishment of the Palestinian Authority under the Oslo Accords, which were signed off, incidentally, by the UN, amongst other people. So they, it has the force of international law. Um, and then in 2005, the Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, but the key the key event was the Six Day War in June 1967, where Israel occupied all these territories, the Sinai, the Golan, the West Bank and Gaza, um, and East Jerusalem. Now, I'm not an international lawyer. Maybe somebody here, is anybody an international lawyer here? It would be nice if there were, it's a, it's a shame. But um, I've looked at this in a, in, a, in a lot of detail and it's quite hard to get a handle on what it is exactly that people are getting at when they talk about the illegality of the occupation. You hear about Israel's illegal occupation and the illegal settlements. And it turns out that the legal status of the occupation and the settlements are linked in people's minds. So they say this, the occupation is illegal, therefore the settlements are illegal. Um, in fact, the legal arguments are extremely complicated and they've been um, really hijacked by this lawfare which has been pursued by Palestinians and their supporters, which is to take Israel to every conceivable international legal authority, including the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the UN and elsewhere, to try to get Israel condemned as an illegal occupier. What I have discovered is there is a technical term which is always applied to Israel and which actually de facto Israel has accepted, which is a, as a belligerent occupier of these territories. And I've tried to find definitions, and there are a couple of definitions, and the key thing about belligerent occupation is that it involves the invasion by one state of another state, of another state's sovereign territory. That's the key way that a, a belligerent occupation is defined. And if we look at the status of the territories that Israel occupied in 67, well, Golan, Syria was the sovereign state. It's not at all clear to, to me whether Syria remains a sovereign state today of any of its territory. Egypt was sovereign in Sinai, and that was handed back. Gaza, Egypt never asserted sovereignty over Gaza. And the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the only, pers the only country that asserted sovereignty was Jordan, and that was, was only recognized by Britain and Pakistan. So in terms of the sovereignty of these territories, apart from the ones that nobody's interested in, 
The remainder, namely the West Bank and Gaza, did not belong to any sovereign na nation that Israel uh, invaded. But on the contrary, Israel moved into those territories as a result of being attacked by, by them. And here's the point, being, here's a linkage of the point that Israel did not undertake a war of aggression against her neighbors, but took the territories as part of a, a defensive exercise. And then the settlements that s ensued from that were ac actually had a, a legal basis in the Palestine Mandate of 1922. And if that sounds a long time ago, um, it turns out the Palestine Mandate is still valid to this day because when the League of Nations was dissolved and the UN was created in 1945, all the provisions of the League of Nations and its mandates were incorporated into the UN Charter. And that's never changed. So if you want to be legalistic about it, and that's what the critics are saying, they're saying it's not, it's not my opinion, it's illegal. Israel shouldn't be there, shouldn't be settling. Well, we can be legalistic too. Um, the International Court of Justice issued an advisory opinion, and the International Court of Justice, I should emphasize, is a branch of the UN. It's a political body. Its judges are elected by the UN and they're not there for their legal expertise. Anyway, they were asked by the Palestinians, of course, to look at the legality of Israel's security barrier. And in 2004, they judged that the settlements were illegal. They weren't asked an opinion on that, but they judged they were illegal because the occupation was illegal. And that is often quoted. Um, but that's one view. There are lots of other views, including the one I've just given you. But media outlets such as the BBC constantly reiterate that the settlements are illegal in international law. Not that the Palestinians claim they are illegal, they are illegal in international law. And I just think that is extremely shoddy r reporting. Um, and I mentioned to you that Israel accepted customary international law if, while, while rejecting those legalistic arguments accepted that um, the, the Fourth Geneva Convention applied in terms of the provision of humanitarian aid. Um, the other thing I, I'm, I'm, I want to really emphasize to you, I'm not in favor of settlement across all of these territories by any means. What I do, because I'm old enough to remember, I know why these settlements were established. They were established by a labor government, a socialist government, not by right-wing religious fanatics, as, they're often, as the settlers are often portrayed today. There are such people. Let's be frank about that. That is not why this, the settlements were established. They were established by a Labour government, first under Levi Eshkol and then Golda Meir and others, and, and continued by Rabin and Perez and others, for one reason and one reason primarily, and that was security. And if you look at where the settlements are, Ignore the little, uh, the little dots all over the, these territories. These are, many of these are extremely isolated. Sometimes they're just one or two outposts, and many of them can be um, removed in 24 hours if they have to be. But the yellow areas are the so-called settlement blocks, the main population centers, and they're all adjoining the green line. That's the ceasefire lines. And that was because after the Six-Day War, when Israel accepted Resolution 242, wanted to negotiate with her neighbors a final peace treaty, the Arab League en masse, that's all the Arab countries, issued the Khartoum Declaration. No peace, no negotiations, no recognition. So Israel said, okay, what are we going to do about the situation? We can't negotiate with anybody, but we, the UN itself recognizes that these ceasefire lines are indefensible. So we are going to create facts on the ground. Now, you can agree or disagree with that, but that was the reason the settlements were created. And actually, in this 73 war, which Israel nearly lost when Syria and Egypt attacked, the settlements were life-saving. The reason why they'd only just started, and most of them were military posts rather than civilian areas. They were largely army positions, and it meant that when... The army had to be mobilized, and Israel is largely an army of, um, it's not an army of conscription, 
it's largely an army of reservists. Um, in order to mobilize the army, the reservists have to be called up. And Israel would have been overrun if it wasn't for this fact that there were settlements that had already been established in Sinai and in the Golan Heights. So these settlements have already proven their worth for security. And we also now know that the, the settlements have never really been an obstacle to peace. Under the various peace plans that have been proposed, the Palestinians have accepted that the settlements were supposed to stay. They only take up 5% or less of the land of the West Bank, and it's the West Bank that we're really consider considering here. Um, they haven't been the obstacle to peace, and the Israelis have accepted the notion, which nobody asked them to, but they, for the sake of achieving a peace treaty, they agreed, okay, if we keep the settlement blocks, the main ones, we will undertake land swaps and we'll give the Palestinians parts of the Negev Desert and elsewhere for their state. The Palestinians accepted that incidentally. That wasn't a sticking point in any of the very, uh, peace negotiations.